So I'm going to come to, if I may, Monica first. Um, Monica, would you just kind of give us a brief intro into how you've come to be doing what you're doing and who you are, yeah, who you are and what you do? I've been, well, I've been working in the film and TV industry for roughly 10 years, started way at the bottom as a runner, um, but and I'd say about four or five years ago, I ended up on a little show called Solo. Uh, yeah, so um, I, that's where I became introduced to VFX. I was working there as a tech coordinator, I then slipped into VFX. Um, and then this show came along early last year. Um, and I had no idea at that point what VP was. And I just sort of jumped in head first and became fully immersed in it, working with a lovely, talented VP supervisor. Thank you very much. That's absolutely brilliant. Nancy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nancy. I'm a virtual production producer at Epic Games. Um, so we actually have an innovation lab space in central London. Um, this is a render of that in the backdrop. Um, it's meant to be a community space or a creative service to, to help everyone on, on your journey if you're using virtual production or if you're using um, game engine in some way. Um, the, the team at Epic Games, I figure we'll just tell you guys a little bit about this if you, you know, ever want to come chat to us about anything that you're working on. Um, we do service um, independent filmmakers, high-end film and TV. We have animation, sport, uh, music, a couple of different categories. Um, the ones that I'm focusing on at the moment um, is high-end film and TV, really pushing boundaries of what's possible with ICV effects. Lots and lots of cool production happening in, in the UK. Um, for that. Independent filmmakers, um, we speak to them a lot about how to leverage virtual production to help them tell their story, maybe a bit faster, maybe a bit cheaper. Um, we also help with funding through the mega grant program. Um, animations, a lot of final pixel rendering and how to do um, stylization with game engine. So you sort of have a very fluid workflow from start to the end. Um, and last one, fashion, which I really see this group as really the, the most experimental kids. Um, they're ready for the metaverse start getting into Fortnite. Um, so a, a variety of different ways we're using the game engine um, and virtual production. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, James, if I may. Yeah. Hi, I'm James Franklin. Um, I'm the virtual production supervisor at Sky Studios. Um, I got into it via, well, I used to work in VFX and I got, I sort of got bored of waiting for the renders. So I started looking at game engines which led me into the immersive department at Sky. Um, and from there, um, having that sort of VFX background and game engine background, it made sense to then look at virtual production, which obviously involves both. Um, so Sky Studios has been involved and now for about a year and a half. Uh, we did our first drama last summer. And then most recently we did a, um, a two week virtual production innovation uh, test which is at the Ari Studios down in Luxbridge. And uh, we've also done quite a bit of uh, uh, previs as well on uh, sort of upcoming scripts. And uh, I guess as well, we've done a little bit of stunt biz, a bit of tech biz, so a little bit of everything really. Fantastic. And finally, um, Michael. And Michael, by the, I, I know Michael's got some visuals to show you. So Michael, feel free to, to play those in at this point as well. Okay, thanks Emma. Um, so I'm Michael McKenna, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Final Pixel. Uh, Final Pixel is a global creative studio. We specialize in virtual production, uh, typically using LED walls and um, game engines, as everyone here is probably well aware of. Um, our base is in the US and in the UK, so I'm here in London. Um, and in the US, my business partners are in uh, New York and Los Angeles. Um, across the, We were set up in 2020, I actually left my job in senior management at Intermont Shine to set up this company. Um, my background is in TV and, um, you know, in the past year and a half, we've run a large number of projects end to end for major clients like Discovery and ABC, all using virtual production in New York, London and LA. Um, we're workforce, workflow specialists, so we've been really honing down on how to do this stuff and how to do it well. Um, so much so we've recently launched our own kind of training academy as well. I'll come and talk a bit more about that in the future. Um, but in the meantime, I think uh, as prompted by Emma, I'll show you our showreel. Um, so you've got something to, it's always nice to have some visuals in these, in these kind of chats. So here we go.
They don't play by the rules. I know, right? It's written in the stars. Family to me are the people that show you unconditional love and support. Dancing with the Stars will blow you away. Thank you. I have words more, but I should probably. No, that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> okay, nice. so now that we've sort of got a sense of who everyone is and, and what they do and where they've come from, um, it's time, I think, to talk about what this session is really about, which is what are the new jobs that have appeared? So I my background is as a, um, a producer and exec producer in high-end television. And when I first started getting involved in this, I, I walked onto, it was Garden Studios actually, walked onto the, and it was, Monica, it was for your test shoot. Um, I, all I was interested in really was, go, who are all these new people that I would not have seen before on a physical stage shooting with this new technology? And having spent sort of nine months looking at this now, and, and we, the panel, we, me and the panel met together last week to, to see if we were in the right sort of spaces. And so we're going to start off by talking about four categories of people that you would never have had normally on a regular physical shoot. And they are loosely um, virtual production supervisor and family. And by that, I mean um, maybe a produce, uh, a virtual production producer, maybe a virtual production coordinator. Then we've got virtual art department. Um, uh, then we've got the people working with the LED walls because they were never in a studio before. And then we've got what I call the software operators. And um, loosely with, with the panel, we talked about this. And some people, as you will hear, will call them slightly different things. We're all beginning to evolve, but I think it'd be really helpful if, if panel bear with me, if we go round, starting with Monica and talk about the roles as we see them and then any more that you see emerging out. And please, meanwhile, it's looking very quiet in the Q&A box. If people have got questions, please post them because in about 20 minutes or so, we will come to you to answer your questions. Um, and that's what this is about, you know, picking the brains of this panel and saying, I'd actually like to work in this world. What's a good background to me to have come to, to go into this role? Do I need to have been an X before I become a Y? If, what training would I need to do in order to do the move from the art department to the virtual art department? That sort of thing. So please get busy in, in the Q&A box. But first of all, yeah, Monica, this virtual production supervisor, what do they do? Who's on their team? I know you can talk about this because you are one. <laughs> um, so virtual production supervisor, I guess, does absolutely everything. Um, so uh, at prep stage, I was in discussions with the VP supervisor in order to uh, break down the scripts and actually identify where we're using VP and how we're using VP. So are we using augmented reality? Are we using simulcam? Is there uh, mocap involved? So that's how they start off. They'll advise on the hardware, the software required, the crew required. Um, 
I think what's quite unique about this show is we are all in house, so I needed a lot of advice on how to crew the virtual production team. Ordinarily, you might use a vendor and the vendor would find the team. Um, the VP Super then may even get into pipeline workflow tools development. So if they have the relevant back background for that, they'll get coding, they'll get um, you know, mind mapping, they'll start building uh, the tools that we're going to then later utilize on set. Um, that person also needs to be effectively a manager. So he needs to manage a team of operators and system techs and D3 ops. And I mean, that there's just so many that on a, almost on a daily, I'm finding there's even more roles that can go in, that can be thrown into this. Um, and a lot of what the super does is about making everything more efficient, faster, more powerful, uh, more responsive to what a set actually requires. Um, so it's uh, it's quite an immense role, I'd say. Um, what's really impressive about uh, Ben Sharp, who is the VP supervisor on Anansi Boys, is he doesn't just know one thing expertly. He knows so many things expertly. He knows what each individual on his team is doing to almost to the same level that they know it, which is really impressive to me. So he can jump in and really help them when um, you know they're, they're facing a problem, which essentially, when you're working with this kind of technology, you're live deving. And that is, that's quite an interesting and complicated thing to be doing during a shoot. Uh, and you have to really know and understand how your utilization of time impacts the rest of the crew and the rest of the show and the shoot schedule. Um, I mean, I could go on forever, to be honest, but I'd say that's that's sort of what I've been uh, observing so far. Out of interest, before I hand over to the others, what? how soon did you come on to Anansi Boys? How many weeks before... And because I think this is, you know, I can see questions asking about costs and savings or not savings. And we'll, we will come to those questions, I promise. But how, when did you start working on Anansi Boys? I started working ad hoc February last year. We didn't move to stage until September. And it was another um, month and a half before we started shoot. So there was, I came on very early. Um, the VFX department were one of the first departments to be brought on board and get up and running and be consulting. Um, and so, you know, I had to start discussing workflows very, very early on and, and workflows led into pipeline and pipeline led into the tech of it all. So um, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Okay, now either Michael um, can I come to you and just uh, see if you want to elaborate on, on this role and maybe um, what you imagine if somebody wanted to move into becoming a virtual production supervisor, maybe where they've come from? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. I could, so I'll talk a bit more about the role, but um, to kind of build on what Monica said, because actually I, I agree pretty much with everything that she, she said about the role. You know, it's exactly how it's we've seen it um it's exactly how we spec it and have, have kind of it's how it's been emerging over the last year and a half um what we'd add to it though is also the the kind of qualities of people that you need for these roles like you know the, there's a long list of tasks but there's also a kind of specific type of person i think that fits really well in that kind of position and it is a leader it's someone that can lead a team on set and is there to not only manage, but be the kind of focal point and be a key point of communication. Um, someone in the chat mentioned that it sounds a bit like a first AD job, um, which I would say, just to pick up on that, um, it's I can see where they're coming from, but actually that this um, this role is very much kind of leading the whole tech side, the tech department, if you like, or for want of a better word, the virtual production team or whatever we're, we're calling it at the moment, or the brain bar, um, you know, but it's actually everything in the studio. So um, you're... VP supervisor is really a kind of really important point of contact for the first AD um, to be able to actually run the shoot rather than taking on you know any of those traditional production roles that come with the first AD. Um, so it's very complimentary in that sense. And it's almost like it's essentially another head of department on the film set that we've not really had before. Um, what I would say also about the type of people is that um, you know we really look for folk who are, who are great under pressure. 
Um, because naturally this type of situation, particularly with all the new technology, really needs a cool head. Um, I'm sure Monica's got that. I can see, um, you know, the stuff goes wrong, um, you know, like it's, it's technology. But as she said, it's live, you know, it's like doing visual effects live. So you're really under pressure. You're really, the focus is on what you're doing on stage. And, um, you know, every the buck kind of stops with you as a supervisor. Uh, and you have to make sure that you're you're really on top of everything and that you know what all your team are doing at any point in time to work towards the overall creative and the look. So so yeah, I would add those two points around, you know, the type of people. So um and then in terms of what you know the, the background where they might come from, um we've recently hired um Jim into um the to run our to run our virtual production supervisor role out of New York. Uh, and Jim, his background is he was a VFX supervisor for a long time, um, but most recently started to do the uh, the Epic Fellowship in, in real time. And so he was a fellow from that. Um, so kind of trans is, is someone who has been interested in real time that has moved from the traditional VFX supervision for, you know, the likes of Apple and, you know, all those large, um, uh, you know, series to now, you know, doing something which is much more um innovative and in the kind of real-time space so yeah so that that's one area people coming from traditional vfx supervisor type roles which i think a lot of people on the panel today are, are kind of from that background but then interestingly you know in the uk we also have um one of our virtual production supervisors is actually from a live events background um so she's more transitioned into learning about ar vr xr and came from that world into virtual production and so, you know, used to travel the world with, um, you know, Led Zeppelin and uh, well, Roger Plant and, you know, all these people doing studio tours. And so, again, has, a, has that great quality of a really cool head and the ability to lead a team on stage. So, yeah, that's, that's just a bit of a flavour, I think, from, from what we've seen anyway in the last year. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, if, if those in, in the audience uh, want to, if you go back and look at our second event, uh, second webinar we did, that was exactly that, looking at these feeder industries, and it absolutely was games and live events, because as you say, if you can, if you can run the LED, or for a lot of the roles of the LED engineers as well, if you can run those big LED walls that tour around the world, you're going to have a big head start over here so I'm actually gonna um move on from that role but keep, I can see the questions are are um mounting up which is brilliant just to note because I'm going back to the first AD this session we're focusing on brand new roles on set we will do a session in a few weeks time um where we look at which roles need upskilling so the first AD will absolutely still exist and need to be but need to be upskilled so that will be as part B of this sort of look at, uh, at um, jobs in VP, if you know what I mean. So what I'd like to do now is um, bring in the other two panelists, is talk a bit about the virtual art departments. Now, again, that's a new department that never existed before. The clue's in the name. Um, and uh, so this, this is the department that works very closely with the real art department, not real, that's awful, with the physical art department. And um, Nancy, could I come to you first to talk about the sort of people you would find in the virtual art department and maybe where their backgrounds come from? Sure. Um, the, I see sort of two buckets of virtual art department artist. Um, this one group that I used to see when I was working on Lion King and Jungle Book type of virtual productions is being able to work really loose and be able to work really fast. They're, they're sort of like your pre-visualization artists in many ways. They need to be game engine savvy. They need to be getting from ideas to paper to, to a finished shot very, very quickly. It's about getting a lot of different ideas out until you get to the right thing so that we could shoot it quickly. Um, with the emergence of the LED tech with this IC VFX, um, so the LED wall type of shoots, this group of people are now really needing to push in another dimension, which is how do I take that art and, and hit photorealism quality, right? Good enough to be put on the wall as part of a scene. And once you capture it in camera, that could be called a final in camera. Um, so that I think is quite a new group. Um, and I, I really see it as different type of skill sets. The previous artists, a lot of them are really, really fast animators. But by the time you get to the photorealism side, we're really looking at industries like VFX or groups that have a more aesthetics um, understanding on how to achieve that level of photorealism. 
100%, this group works really closely with the art department. They're normally led by um, a production designer role. Um, so just like they have an art department that can help them execute all the way to the physical build, this idea of having a virtual group that can execute all of your CG builds um, all the way from, from translating from concept art um, all the way to that, um, that final image on the wall. Thank you. James, love to come to you. Um, I think what's quite interesting, and, and, and Nancy's touched touch on it, is the sort of hierarchy. Because I know we were talking when you were doing the test shoot about finding art department who were interested in working this sort of way. It's interesting to hear about where does the production designer sit with the virtual art department and what have you observed about people, you know, how those two groups of people work together? Yeah, it's that's a good question. I mean, I've observed how it shouldn't be done, if that helps. <laughs> Brilliant. <That's, laughs> let's talk about it because, so, you know, we're all learning, right? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone knows how it should be done. I mean, basically what should happen is that the virtual or the VAD teams is known should be working with the production designer and the art director, you know, from the from the off. Because that blend between what's on the LED wall and what's on the stage should be just that. It should be a blend and it should match. So whether that's, um, say, you're designing um, something for the physical sets, that could be then scanned and it could then be taken and put into the LED wall so that they match exactly and you get that nice flow uh, with, with no join. In terms of the skill sets, I think um, I was interesting. I was talking to, I was scanning a set during the lockdown because the crew couldn't visit the set, so they sent me instead. But they, do, they also sent the art director and she said, oh, you're going to be, you're going to be replacing my job soon. You're here with your scanner and your and I said, no, what do, what do you mean? She said, oh, because I just go back and I put it, you know, in, um, I think she uses SketchUp. I'm like, well, you're sort of doing the job. You're putting it into a digital world. That could then for be then taken beyond that world into an LED wall. It could be, I think there's this sort of misconception that there's this, I think a lot of people who are doing the work can do 60, 70, 80% of it already. I think the hard bit they've already learned, there's just this small tweak where they have to, learn a few rules about how the screens work, what does work, what doesn't work. Um, and I think that in terms of the, the skill set, it's the hardest bit, so being a good designer. Um, and if you're a good designer, the tools don't, don't really matter. So a um, bit of a waffly answer, but um, I think, I don't no, think people so. should be, and I think maybe more generally as well, people shouldn't be too, the whole point of this technology I feel is it's, it should eventually make people's lives easier. Um, we're now shooting in camera. We can see what we're shooting. You know, someone, whether they're um, an art director, production designer, um, can see immediately on set if something's working or not. The virtual art department can work with them and say, okay, well, if we tinker with this, will that help your practical set? So this, I know it's a cliche, but the collaboration really does exist. It, everybody on set really gets into it. Once once the teething problems are out of the way and everyone's in full flow, it's a, it's a really nice way to work. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm now gonna, again, switch it up a bit and talk about the third sort of category of people. Um, and I know, again, do throw in different names of what you would call, but the world, and we alluded to it, of LED engineering, LED techs. I've heard system engineers who run the, the LED areas do talk about the, the fact that it's not just the LED wall, there's the tech, there's the, um, the software, the chips that go in it. And who do I pick on first? Michael, talk about that role, the LED engineers, operators, etc. Yeah, I think there's multiple roles in what you've just like outlined. You know, there's the there's definitely a, an LED tech, you know, which is actually quite a traditional role in some sense. You know, there's been again, going back to live events, a lot of the LED techs that we've worked with have came from that world and are very kind of established and know their stuff and have been doing it for a long time. Um, and to sort of move into that that kind of job, you typically have an AV video type background. Um, and that's what I'd say in general is that this engineer area um, is is one that needs to be really quite strong and knowledgeable on on video and you know AV systems, um, and that's that's a really kind of 
um, you know, something that's been around for a long time. You know, this isn't this isn't really new stuff. A lot of the, the kind of core AV knowledge that goes into running some of these systems, understanding frame rates, understanding um, how things network together, understanding um, you know what the what everything is doing, how it's communicating with each other, all comes from that world of AV. It's 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 the kind of a very engineering based thing, as you say. Um, so I think you know if I was to look at that kind of gamut of roles, there's um, the LED techs. There's also maybe a, a lead engineer that's involved in actually um, sort of helping put together the studio. You like we would, we would always try and have at least one person kind of as, as a lead that understands what's going on with each different aspect, even if they don't know all the detail of exactly how the camera tracking is being set up and that we've got a specialist involved to actually set up the camera tracking. They know that, you know, in principle, how that's communicating and how the communications with all the rest of the systems are optimised. And that's the really key thing because, you know, it's all about creating a studio which um, delivers the best results. There's, there's lots of different ways to, to wire these things up and different types of hardware, different types of software that you can use. Um, our workflow is one that typically uses Disguise. And so that comes with like, you know, quite a kind of set approach to hardware and software that's been, um, you know, very optimized in some ways by, by, that, by that company. Um, so what we've been doing when, when we set up is, you know, um, sort of replicating that in different countries. And so what we find is, um, yeah, there's a very kind of similar type of role you need each time, um, you know, around uh, the disguise side as well. So we'd always have a disguise operator. We would always um, look to also have some more junior people learning disguise on set as well. So people learning D3, um, you know, again, that's kind of getting more into the software side, but it's, it's really important because the the disguise is actually a hardware and software kind of thing. Um, there's obviously other systems out there you can you can run just with end display, in which case you're, you're really relying on Unreal Engine and people that understand how to run Unreal Engine, um, which, you know, again, is kind of, on the, on the fringes of like who runs the studio, but very much a, a huge part of what that end result is going to look like. Um, in terms of other roles in there, you know, there's obviously other people involved in, in rigging and, you know, there's a lot of crossover with like traditional crew in that sense, um, you know, uh, very similar skill sets uh, to like lighting crew, for example. Um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I've missed anyone. Probably have, um, but sorry if I have. But there's, there's definitely, uh, they're probably the main ones to touch on. Yeah. And like I say, a lot of that area is, is actually quite well established. Established. It's the the VP supervisors and the you know the Ben Sharps of the world that are kind of helping you know bring the, all these existing technologies together. Is is kind of what then seals the virtual production studio. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, quietly in the background the panel have been chatting and they're going to go in and start answering some of the questions that they can just quickly make so sort of feel free to i'm going to move on to the last bit um and then we'll dive into any of the questions that that would be good to to hear um live is what i've called the uh software operators all sort of there's a, a word and i'm going to go around um nancy monica and james to just talk about this group of people that are now called the brain bar and uh they as they will explain they run and work on the various softwares you've slightly heard talk about now um as i say that was probably the biggest thing when i first walked in, into a volume of going who are all those people sitting behind computers and servers? What do they do? So if I come to Monica first and then maybe Nancy and then James to talk about those operators and artists um, uh, that are sitting on what some people like and some people don't like calling the brain bar. So um, we call those people stage operators we might we might specify that they are unreal engine stage operators if we're crewing for example um, because you also have d3 operators who might specialize in disguise um, so a large part of what they might be doing each one of them you might just call them all stage operators but each one of them will have a specialism so and even in within unreal engine there's really there's specific tools that you can uh, specialize in and become very good at um, they'll be taking environments for example from vendors or artists of the VAD team and they will look to get that optimized for the volume and get it merged and integrated with the software that renders it out 
So if you're using Disguise, for example, um, you've got to integrate your Unreal Engine uh, environment into Disguise. Um, and you might be re receiving environments from, you know, very different skill sets of artists so you've got to make sure that everything actually lines up with how you've built your system um, a lot of what our guys do is um, to make sure that everything is optimized and working as fast as it can because uh, otherwise things can slow down very quickly um, we've got people who work with blueprints which is, i don't know if people know a lot about that but you know there, there's there's a certain amount of coding involved. Um, and then there's also the creative side of it of making sure that you're serving what the DP wants and you know acting on lighting notes, for example, and making sure that you've got um, all the right levels for making sure it looks exactly how your supers and your creatives want it to look. Um, it, it's in, it, there's an immense amount that you can actually go into and specialize in, um, yeah. Um, Nancy? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a great coverage. Um, I, I really see the stage, we call them stage operators as well, and uh, we really see them as ninjas, you know, they're, <laughs> it's it's quite quite a multidisciplinary role. Um, yes, at its core, they are their position at the brain bar, they are driving the wall, they're making sure the content is running at the right performance so that the camera could be tracking to it. Um, but at, they're, they're also people who understand a bit about networking, they understand hardware, uh, they understand perforce on how information is stored. Um, they know a little bit about color, making sure that the color um, coming in that was approved by, by the creative team, by the time it goes into camera, it is still the same image. Um, IT is just it's just quite quite a dynamic role. It's definitely um, it's a great role for anybody who's working on set, working live events that have that calmness under pressure that that can communicate concisely um, to to say here are a couple of options. Things will not always go well. Um, virtual production is still a bit of a nascent technology. It's it's not going to work for all these new scenarios you're using it for, um, and and that's okay. Um, <laughs> and being on set is expensive. Losing time is really really stressful. So um, a, a lot of that is balancing all those needs and at the end of the day still get the best um, best thing up there so all the other departments can continue their work thank you james yeah that's a pretty good summary i think um on our uh, uh we call them stage supervisors as well and we have um t t uh, normally we'd have two unreal ops um one managing the content or one one that knows the content. So when changes are made, they know where everything lives within the project. So they're not just sort of, you know, wildly thrashing around trying to make lighting changes. Uh, and the other person's sort of more responsible for getting it then onto the onto the screens. Um, and then we have our uh, typically two um, tracking operators um, because you find yourself recalibrating the tracking quite often. Um, I think the difficulty we found with finding the right sort of unreal ops is you can have an unreal operator who can be excellent um but i think as michael pointed out the pressure is it's, it's quite um when you know when you've got a, a large crew standing around waiting for you to do something and what you're doing is often you know seen by everybody that's quite a stressful thing to do um so finding people that work well in a live environment is difficult um so that's that's something that we struggle with um yeah and you just have to really know um really have to know your stuff it's it seems a lot easier when you're just doing it you know in a studio in a darkened room but when you're doing it in front of all these people you've, you've got to be pretty good at it so um not an easy role but but it's a great role if you can do it because obviously you know you're playing around with the with the world essentially brilliant Thank you. So um, we're going to dive into questions from the audience. I'm just going to take a moment first because there's a lot of people asking about training and I just let you know what what's in the pipeline. Ha ha ha. No pun intended uh, for screen skills so that that we can skip over those. We um, we have currently um, some training about to go up for VisFX artists to learn Unreal. So keep an eye on the website for that. That's with um, the another department at Screen Schools called High End TV. Um, if anyone 
uh, is clever enough, uh, Kevin, you might be able to post that up. And we are we will be quite soon announcing Unreal training for art department people. So that I hope will go up in the next um, month or so. We will also be looking for training providers to start delivering specific training in areas like mocap for camera operators, LED wall technologies for those people who want to get into that sort of thing. Um, what else are we doing? A bit of etiquette training for VFX people who now want to work on virtual production. So come out of the nice darkened room and, and onto the set and have lots of people standing around, as James said, tapping their fingers and looking at their watch. So there will be that sort of training, which I hope we will have running in about May time. So as far as training goes, keep, keep an eye on the Screen Skills website. But I'm going to ask a few questions. I think there's a lovely one for James here saying, um, it's from Amber, saying, um, what skills have you learned by transitioning from VFX to working in VP? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, I, I transitioned because um, I was bored of waiting for render times. So I was, I was doing stuff and I'm not a gamer, but I was seeing adverts for games on TV and some of the graphics were way better than the stuff I was waiting for you know, 12 hours to render. So I thought, oh, hang on, this is this is surely the future. So that then piqued my interest in game engines, and I figured, well, this is where it's probably going to go. Um, so the skill set really was, I mean, a lot of it you already know about shaders and materials. That's that's all common to both VFX and game engines. Um, and then transitioning to VP in general, well, I mean, VP is sort of built around digital assets. So if you have a good handle on that, then that's a good starting point. Um, I think, and, and I, when I say VP, I don't mean just the LED volume. I'm talking about the whole process from from reading a script and analyzing how, as, as Monica mentioned earlier, you, you have to sort of devise a plan. Uh, is it even going to work in an LED volume? Do you need an LED? Are you just going to do the previs? Because sometimes that's enough and you might just want to shoot it for real. But so that sort of, you know, analyzing scripts and then all the way through to um, maybe creating stuff for LED, LED walls and then being on the shoot itself and devising tools so you can change your environments on the fly and you know there's no point doing wildly complicated environments that look great um, if you can't change them quickly. Um, I've slightly forgotten the question, sorry. It was, uh, well, I, think, I think it was, what new things have you learned walking? What new things have I learned? Well, probably all other. those things. Um, uh, I guess yeah, the, the one thing you really, that it really is good to know about, as, as Monica was talking about earlier, is blueprints. Uh, or if you're using Unity, it really does help to know some C Sharp. Um, I used to use Unity before I used... Um, um, Unreal, and I found that it just opens up a whole new world. You can start creating your own tools. You can um, you can talk to people who do it better than you in a language they understand, so you know what you're asking of them. Um, you don't have to be the world's best at it. You don't have to be the world's best at any of this if you want to be sort of across all of it. But um, it's only if you're really specialising in one particular role. But I think whatever you're doing, it's good to have a knowledge of what everybody else's role is because it's because it's so new because everything's shifting in terms of who respond who is responsible for what i think it's useful to to have an overview definitely perfect thank you um I've got quite a specific question maybe this is one for nancy um somebody says i'm coming from a lighting artist role in vfx what's the equivalent role on set in vp and is unreal engine what i should be familiarizing myself with nancy i'm sure you're going being sings your epic you're going to say yes to the unreal bit <laughs> <laughs> biased biased uh, person to answer um i think lighting is uh, especially lighting artists in vfx is extremely transferable skill to virtual production um one when the the content team so uh, the virtual art department team lighting is super super important look dev is a very important important part of that uh, that world building. Um, so 100% that translate. Um, would you need to know how to um, handle uh, render and a lot of like scene optimizations, how to do lighting beautifully without it being so expensive in game engine versus uh, when, when you're in VFX where it could render for thousands and thousands of hours overnight. Um, yes, I think that that is a bit of upscale that is worth looking into. Um, but otherwise, I think that's great. Um, 
For being on set, I think you could look into one of the stage operator disciplines, which is more on the um, real-time content change side. So normally we have a couple of different stage operators that can focus on different things. We normally have someone um, behind the brain bar that is really familiar with the content that could be adjusting it as, um, as your DOP is sort of sending out requests. So that could be, if you're specifically looking for an onset role, that could be something to look into. Um, but definitely, I think most of the production we come across are looking for those type of generalists. Yeah, brilliant. Monica, question for you. Uh, sounds like you're using disguise. How many operators would you be using? How many disguise operators would there be in, on the brain bar maybe? Well, we are using two disguise operators. We have one um, assistant who um, is also training and learning, um, but also has already got quite a good amount of experience with disguise. Um, what I would also say is we also have disguise support behind us um, to help us with the merging of the worlds. Uh, so you could actually have a lot more than what we have um, but Disguise have kindly uh, offered their support and um, they're sort of just on the phone whenever we need them, whenever we want to make something faster um, or make it work a little bit better, merge seamlessly. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say maybe because this is a TV show, perhaps in film, you may have a few more. You may have up to four, maybe five on set. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, there's a lot of questions about up from people with no experience saying, I want to get into VP. Maybe Michael, um, what I'd say first of all is you've heard now about four very different roles. VP is a, a big thing. Um, so hopefully you've come to hear, I'm more of that sort of a person, I'm a that sort of a person. But Michael, if somebody was absolutely hell bent, new person wanted to get in, what would you suggest that they focus on as a, as a skill to make sure they have before they knock on doors? Um, I've been happily answering loads of questions there <laughs> on, the, on this exact topic. So, um, you know, saying to people, you know, if you're really, really keen and interested in this area, you know, get in touch with us anyway, because we're always recruiting and we're always bringing on interns and stuff. But, you know, I'd say in general, the right now, actually, because this is such an innovative area, the, the desire and the passion to kind of work in virtual production and to learn and to kind of be quite entrepreneurial in what you're doing is probably one of the, the kind of most valuable skills you could have to come into this type of role because a lot of it's still being defined like if you, if you want to turn up and be given a job description and be told this is exactly what you're doing every day I don't think you're going to get that with virtual production right now um there's going to be very few jobs that are like that so you, you need to have a real willingness to just come in and, and, and be part of something and be part of something which is um really quite challenging and quite difficult at times and, and so willing to operate in a, in a degree of uncertainty um, but you know, if, if there was any like kind of specific tools or skills to learn, um, obviously we keep kind of touching on it. There's there's different op different um, game engines out there, but Unreal Engine naturally, um, I would you know get your head a little bit around that. It's free. You can download it. Anyone can use it. Really, it's really simple to get started with. By downloading Unreal Engine and getting into it a little bit, you'll have some concept of you know what it means to be operating in a three D game engine and what what that really allows you to do um so kind of scratching the surface surface of unreal is really crucial for everything alongside that i would say you know just a good understanding of film and tv this is still film and tv production so even our technical artists you know they they the best ones are ones that can also get a grasp of how cameras work you know what not to a detailed level but you know what does a focal length mean you know well, you know, what is distances if you're shooting on a, a very tight lens, you know, where's the camera going to be positioned in the studio? These types of things are really important because, you know, there's an interaction between a virtual camera and Unreal and a real world camera on the stage. So, you know, we're in filmmaking. So, you know, like definitely just having a good ground in the film and TV is, is going to help you in any of these situations. I would I'm say. really glad you mentioned that, Michael, because we had two amazing tech graduates join who um, know everything about Unreal and networking and everything like that but didn't know anything about um um sort of if i mentioned like an f-stop they would just look at me like well, what what on earth are you and why should they you know they're yeah. they, 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 they relatively young they've come straight out of the tech grad um scheme um 
but just knowing the basics, like you said, was what we actually ended up doing was we went out for the day in London with just a regular Olympus film camera, which only has you know aperture f stop yeah. and film speed, and and it's going okay. We've got no metering controls on this, but you will figure out how to you know. And after a day of just doing that, they were oh, okay. I get the interplay between the three variables, I was, yeah. and and that knowledge on stage is really great to have because when DOP is sort of talking about these things, you know what they're they're asking for. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, there's a lot of people chat uh, in asking questions about how can I, how should camera people upskill to this area. Monica, maybe would you jump in there talk a little bit about mocap and. Um, and the things that are stuck on top of the cameras now, just to annoy the camera team? <laughs> um, uh, thankfully, we have an amazing camera team, so they haven't been too annoyed. Um, what I would say is, it's, it's less about sort of upskilling and more about understanding on both sides. So, um, you know, I, I've heard it from so many shows where, um, you know, an individual from the VP team has touched a piece of equipment that um, it, it's it's camera equipment or it's lighting equipment. It's not theirs to touch, and um, and there's also the etiquette of uh, you know we have cam we have people from camera who might come along and just start talking to the people at the brain bar and and you know they're in the middle of like fixing a crash or something and uh, they just really need to concentrate. And so we've we've had this sort of learning process of being like let's let's respect each other's spaces and just communicate that okay well now this thing is going to be attached to your camera how does that impact you does the weight throw off the lens um do we need to add more time in for prep to make sure that everything works well together um other than that there's not really masses to learn um beyond just having those conversations uh, and then seeing what the requirements are i mean we've been using the industry has been using mocap for for years so um that's not so much a brand new thing Thank you. I mean, I, I think, yeah, that that's, the, you know, the learning that I hear and the team here and everyone here all the time is that actually a lot of the roles will remain exactly the same. There just needs to be an awareness and a, a willingness to, to, to collaborate and, and talk about the slight differences. So this is not changing the world. And there's been a couple of people talking about the speed of evolution and maybe Michael could come, or, or James, I haven't heard from James for a minute, but um, talk about how fast things are moving on. And is that actually a hindrance or is it really exciting? Um, I mean, I would say first of all, it's really exciting. Like it's, I, I don't think I remember a time, certainly in my career, where there was so much energy around a lot of kind of converging technologies and um, opportunity. You know, we we recently ran a test with live motion capture data going into Unreal Engine, having having a, a rendered creature of really high quality on the LED wall, um, having that interact with a, with a human. You know, we've, we've been doing things that are kind of breaking new ground every month. And um, it's such a great time for innovation to bring all these things together that is truly, really exciting. Yeah. But yeah, James, you can jump in. Yep. Well. James, you've got about a minute. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, no, I agree. It's 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 rare to have a job where you can honestly say on some days no one's ever done this before, and I think that's one of the nice things about it. Um, I had it in, in immersive, and now I'm experiencing it again in in virtual production. So it's yeah, it's really it was a real privilege to to work in this area. 